listening to the Insum Insider with your hosts, Michel Scamini and Monty Latulay. Welcome to the Inside. Uh, this is a special edition of the Insum Insider. Uh, my, my name is Monty Latulay. I'm your host. And with me, as always, my good friend, member of the Apex family, Michelle Scamini. Michelle, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks, Monty. Good to be back on the Insider again. It is. It is. I, uh, I'm coming to you today from Houston, Texas, home of the World Series champion Houston Astros. So we're very proud of that. The city's a buzz. Yeah, it's been a while since we gathered in uh, in this fashion, Michelle. It has, but somehow it just feels like just yesterday. It's good to be back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I looked back at some of the episodes that we did uh, during the during the lockdown and uh you know, they served a very, very distinct purpose at that time. Yeah, um, during lockdown, we were looking for ways to stay connected to the Apex community. We really missed the interaction, and it was sort of our way of of keeping that interaction alive. So, yeah, it was, uh... yeah, yeah, I liked it at the time. You know, there was there was some technical content being pushed out there, but you know what we 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 had a different um, different focus, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, working with you during during that so it, it's great to dust it off again for like i said this this special edition thankfully the worst of all that appears behind us i mean i guess you're the new normal uh what we can call the new normal i mean we're going to be living with this uh, it looks like much like the flu or or something like that but it's great to get the band back together um we do have a a new band member uh joining us today it's in some zone rich so rich welcome to the in some insider Thanks for having me. And Rich, one of the things that I find uh, uh, most Im- most impressive about you is when it comes to the Oracle stack, your knowledge is, is very deep and very wide. Uh, and a lot of times in the Apex community, we have people that can go very deep. Uh, certainly, so, certainly our developers uh, go very, very deep when it comes to Apex. But then there are others that once you get outside of Apex, uh, you know, they, their, their experience and their knowledge can, can drop off precipitously, but that's, that's definitely not you. No. Uh, and you know, it's probably because I'm so old <laughs> and because I've had so many different jobs, right. Being a sales engineer at Oracle, I kind of had to learn a little bit of everything doing this, uh, consulting thing, um, and teaching at, um, Austin community college. Right. And then all the clients that I work with, I tend to, instead of just working on a specific Apex project, it's like, we have this problem, we need to solve it, and let's just solve it. And getting, you know, I I envy those who can spend a lot of time in Apex and are really good Apex developers. I can do a little bit, those people can do a lot, but I trade that with some other stuff, right? Yeah, we're lucky. We're lucky to have you on uh, on on the on the on the task here, and, and uh, as a member of Ensum, because you know a lot of times the full solution can extend outside of Apex. You know, because you're yeah. you're integrating with uh, your there's touch points out outside of Apex. So when you talk about full comprehensive solutions, and we need you, we need you for sure. Hey, um, someone else that's deep and wide is in much the same way as our guest uh, today's guest, Carrie Millsap. Monty, normally you do the intros. I'm going to let you do the intro, but I'm also going to save you the trouble. Do you remember this is not the first time you've introed Carrie Millsap? K Scope 2012, San Antonio, Texas. Does that oh. ring a bell? Here. Yes, yeah, it rings a bell. All right, which brings me to our special guest this evening. I have a huge man crush on Carrie Millsap. Boy, that feels good to get off my chair. I'm going to turn my mic off for a minute. <laughs> it's when I had on that dress this afternoon that I really, really, really realized it. No, seriously, you spend a short amount of time with Carrie and you realize uh, what kind of person he is, what kind of colleague he is, what kind of friend, what kind of husband, what kind of father he is. He's the kind of person that everyone tends, tends to gravitate towards. He uh, won the prestigious uh, K-Scope Editor's Choice Award last year in Long Beach. Uh, He's an Oracle Ace director, a member of the Oak Table Network, the first person I think of when I think of optimizing Oracle performance, most importantly, a friend of Odie Tug. Tonight, 
He will talk to us on learning about life through business and software. Please join me in bringing to the stage Carrie Millsap. Thank you, Cowboy Monty. Thank you very much. Now, I got so vexed there, I forgot whether my mic's on or off. It's on, right? All right, I definitely remember that. I definitely remember that. That's uh, what well, was kind of glitching there at the, at the beginning, but that's. Oh, was it? Sorry about that. I was so excited the, when I found that video. That well, awesome. that's, that's uh, you know, for all the video that I have out there, uh, I'm, I'm fine with you finding that one. It's far worse. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it's whenever I profess to my uh, man crush on, on Carrie, and uh, and it, it's still there. It's still there. It hasn't, uh, the feels are, the feels are still strong, Carrie. <laughs> Good. Good. I feel the love from from uh, half a state away. <laughs> Gosh. No, it's uh, it, it's it, it's always a pleasure to. Uh, I mean, I've heard you talk many, many, many times, but uh, I never pass up an opportunity to to catch one of your sessions. We were scheduled against uh, our opposite each other at uh, Dallas earlier, and uh, I was still tempted to bail on my session <laughs> <laughs> because I learned something every single time, uh, every single time, and. The last talk that you gave that I was able to attend at, at Dallas, uh, did you did talk about excerpts from the book, and it was uh -huh. great. I loved it. Loved it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You could have just done the books on tape, and I would have sat there all day. That would, <laughs> that would have been great. So, so I did. I did want to remind the audience that we're here to talk about Carrie's book faster. Um, there's a QR code on the screen. Oh, Carrie, I'm going to put the QR code on Monty's face. Please. I'll, I'll put the book in front of my face. So you shared a copy with the Insom team, and we were really excited about it, enjoyed it, and uh, wanted to have you on the show to talk about it, uh, share with the share with the community. I love it. Now, you know, we know we, we know each other. Uh, we know each other very well. But uh, what are some of the things that uh, you know? Tell us a little bit about yourself for the people who haven't had the, the privilege of knowing you for, for all these years, and. And secondly, what motivated you to, to, to pin the book? I remember the old Saturday Night Live joke. I was born in a house my father built. Um, <laughs> the uh, now, nah, I guess the place on the timeline where anybody would really care where I've been kind of started in about 1985, 88. Um, graduated college with a math and computer science degree and then went on to get a master's in computer science. I was a compiler, I was a language designer, and then I would write compilers to implement the languages that I designed. And got to do that in, a, in some really interesting projects with uh, like a micro you know, chip manufacturer. I did some work for United Technologies. And then um, I joined Oracle in 1989 and kind of wandered the, wandered the world um, trying to find myself but sort of locked in by about 1991 or so into a role where I was a uh, an on the road consultant, different place every week, 35 weeks a year kind of thing. Um, when I wasn't at customer sites trying to fix performance problems and do installations and upgrades and things like that, I would be in a you know either creating course course material or in a classroom teaching my Oracle colleagues what I was getting on the road. Um, I spent 10 years and a week at Oracle. The week was at the end, not the beginning. Um, 10 years and a week at Oracle doing that. I, I was in charge of about 100 people when I left uh, Oracle in 1999 to go do the entrepreneur thing. And so I founded a company in 99, uh, moved out and founded another company in 2008. And that's Method Art Corporation, who I represent today. And really, for, for 30 years, my focus has been um, optimizing performance mostly in an Oracle context, but not strictly, you know, restricted to the Oracle context. Now, back when you first joined Oracle, I mean, some of the <clears throat> some of some of the folks that became household names for us, like Tom Kite and, and Stephen, had an early stint. Did mm -hmm. it, were you guys aware of each other, or at that time you guys oh, yeah. were just worker bees, or, or what? How did that go? No, Tom Kite and I were were particularly close. We'd pick him up at the airport anytime he'd be coming to DFW to go someplace, and you know, I I saw him in a number of cities around the world, and, and enjoyed you know every minute of of that. Stephen, I didn't spend as much time with, but I but I knew him. It's just that we weren't the same. We weren't at the same types of places. 
Nice. Um, I shared a stage with Tom a couple times and, you know, I'd stand up there in front of his audience of 5,000 people, which was, <laughs> which was humbling. Um, and then Steven and I have been friends for a long time, but, but we've never actually um, been at the same site at the same time, except at conferences. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, as far as the book goes, did, uh, did, did, was, was, were, were people just coming to you saying you should write a book, you should write a book? Or? Well, the book is my COVID baby. The, you know, there was a, there was a time there where you're not supposed to go anywhere and nobody had any budget to do anything. And for a long time, um, I've been wanting, it's, it's kind of, you, you may remember, I th you, you even mentioned the title of it. I'm going to reach around here. It is. Um, y'all probably remember that book from the early two thousands. Yeah. And when I got the itch to write that, I, I remember I was in Alaska with my wife doing a, a conference. And when she and I talked about it and I decided to do it, the, the main motive to do that old book, the 20 year old book was fear that somebody else would beat me to it. And in the COVID thing, there was a little bit of that, but honestly, if you put your mind back in, in the, you know, the early 2020 timeframe, I mean, we're being told every day that if you're over 40, you're probably going to be dead in a year. And I thought, well, hell, if I'm going to be dead in a year, I'd kind of like my, my wife and kids to know what I've devoted my life to. I'd like to write down some of the things I've done and the way I think about problems and things. And it's not that my kids read, but maybe someday they'll miss their dad and, you know, be interested in, in what did he have to think, you know, during that, during that lockdown period. So I really wrote that, that faster book almost as like a, I don't know, like a, like a legacy thing, you know, to, if anybody cares what I've done, I, I wanted people to have access to, to my perspective on it. So I don't mean to sound morbid, but that was honest to God. That was what was going through my mind is like, well, uh, if, uh, you know, if there's 20 percent chance I'm going to be dead, well, I, I better do this now because I I thought about <laughs> oh, doing it at some point, And I thought, well, no time like no time like when I'm locked in my house. I really I tell really you of all it. the of all the things that were going through my mind during the lockdown period. Writing a book was was not one of them. So it goes to you. Uh, as money will <laughs> I was tell you, like I'm not strangling my family that we were all on top of one another and trying to just get our get through our days. So kudos. Well, to I, you I really have that. enjoyed. I really have enjoyed the book. And um, prior prior to reading your your book faster, I enjoyed the Phoenix Project. I thought that was a really a great book, and uh, yeah. I really enjoyed it. But this one is uh, this one tops on my list right now because I've already kind of knew some of the stories from your talks and uh -huh. I just, just think it's great. I'm so flattered that you bring this book and the Phoenix project in the same breath. Cause when, uh, now I haven't told you guys something, um, this book right here in the current form, which you can get at Amazon is only going to be available for probably another five months or so. Um, because I've signed a deal with, I haven't signed it, but I expect to today or Monday with, uh, with O'Reilly, they're going to pick it up and distribute it. So it'll be a little different. It'll look a little different. It'll probably have some improvements based on their editing, you know, that they're going to bring to the project. But um, you get to choose the animal. You know what? I, I told him on our negotiation call on Tuesday, I want some input. And they said, yep, you can you can definitely have input this time because on is there an armadillo uh, already in. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, the animal I want is the robber fly. The robber if you, fly. If you Google the robber fly is a big, ugly dude. He's got a big hump on his back. Um, and he's very hairy, but they, they attack wasps and other flies and they do airborne intercept. So oh. they're the, they're the optimized, they're, they've got the best vision of any insect and they've, they've got the optimized flight characteristic of, of any insect. And I'd be, That's I'd be honored to be represented by the robber fly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you mentioned you were thinking of your kids when you were writing the book, is that potentially why you wrote it as it's a 250 page book and there's 111 chapters. Right. And you're like, yeah, you know what? Like it'll probably read a page in a chapter. If it's well, a page. <laughs> so the inspiration from, from that comes from a couple of sources. One is I started off writing it in just my kind of default style from my back, my educational background in math is um, theory first. And if you can apply it, then hooray, but, theory, theory, theory. That's the interesting stuff. And the way I, the way I started writing this was chapter one definitions, you know, 
performance. Performance is measurable in this way or that way. And the definition of throughput is this and the definition of response time is that. Well, I did it that way for about a month. And then I started realizing I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning and go look at that stuff anymore. I, and I thought, you know what, if this project is so boring that even the author can't tolerate it, what chance do I have anybody's going to read it? And I thought and thought I did my Pooh Bear thing, you know, where I'm like, think, think, think. And, and um, it occurred to me that this is not the first time I've ever had this problem. The first time I had this problem was in presenting, which I'm on stage a lot. And I figured out over the years that people, people aren't mathematicians. They're not very many of them are anyway. And they don't like their information theory first. They like their information story first. You tell me a story. And if I'm interested enough in the story, then maybe I'll hang out and see if there's a lesson or two to be learned from it. But mostly I want the next story after the first story. And that's how people are. And it's really how I am too. It's just not my early habits as an author. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll tell the story. Why, why am I writing this at all? Well, it starts with Bob and then it goes to Phyllis. And then, you know, and these, these people that influenced my life um, have given me the stories that I need to, to go. So back Rich to your question about why are there, why are, you know, you divide 250 pages by 111 chapters and you can calculate the chapters are an average of two pages a piece. So this comes from another story. I, I used to visit Denmark quite frequently. My uh, my friend Mons Norgard used to host in January every year a master class. And the first one was me. And then there was Tom Kite and Jonathan Lewis and lots of other people. And one of the books in Mons' bathroom, there's he, there was a bookshelf in Mons' bathroom. Of course there would be. And one of the books in the bathroom was called something like, and I should research this and really remember the title, but it's something like what to do when you're in the loo. And it's a book that's about this thick. And if you open it at random, you'll find a chapter's starting point. And a chapter is typically only one page, maybe two. And it'll be like page 175. It'll be like the Cecropia moth. And then page 192 will be why swimming pools are the depth that they are. And, you know, page 58 will be like, why does your fingernail have those stripes on them? And just like everything. But no matter where you picked it up and opened it, there would be something there that would catch your attention. And you could read two or three paragraphs and be done with it. And I thought, that's the kind of book I want to have. I want to have a book that no matter where you open it, you just like pick it up and yeah. boom right here. Sure. I can start and end. I, I've got this page and that page. And that's not that much of an investment. Yeah. And if you like that, maybe you'll turn the page. You yeah, know, I'm I, an info love... junkie. Sorry, I'd sorry. Say I'm an info junkie, so I would, I'd be compelled to finish the book. It would have, uh, it would, have, it would have, been my, it would have extended my stay. <laughs> so I can't, <laughs> yeah. I can't put a book down after I started. <laughs> no, I loved, I really loved that format. It was, it was very easy to read. Not going to lie, my favorite when I got to a chapter that said Bob or Phyllis or Doug, I was like, yay, it's going to be a story and it's going to be a good one. So it was a really, really nice, uh, nice format. Awesome. Um, well, carrying me... the early chapters, you talked about looking at the right it. And uh -huh. I think Anton's joining us in the audience as well. I've got a story about Anton looking at the right it, but wonder if you could sort of talk about that a little bit and, and the, the importance of looking at the right it. Sure. And, and there are tons of stories that all really line up to that in my early days. I mean, one, one of the kind of in my earliest days at Oracle, I would just get sent someplace with a task and the task might be, you know, redistribute the data files across seven disks and they've only got three now. So, you know, NUFUS and FSCK and all that Unixy stuff, I'd do that. And then I would export and then import all the data back and I'd spread it out a different way than it, than it came out. And that was my job, right? I would be told the Wednesday before, here's, it's kind of like Charlie's Angels. Remember they sit around a table and Bosley or whoever the guy is, is like, next Monday you'll be in Frankfurt, Pennsylvania. And you'll need to fly into this airport and, and you're going to meet these people and their task is going to be blah. And the first few I went to, the task was blah, was fine. I'd go and I'd do my thing. But I started realizing that there was typically a bigger thing that people wanted from my visit than just what I thought I was doing. Um, and the Phyllis chapter is very early in the book, um, tells the story of me finishing my stuff, you know, like on Wednesday, I'm okay, I've rebalanced your whatever. 
And then they introduced me to Phyllis, this accountant's lady who comes in and she's got like a, like almost like a flock of geese. She's got like a triangle of people behind her who are interested in, in what I've been doing. And I haven't met any of them. And then it was explained to me that Phyllis would sit at this terminal right here at this little VT320. And she was going to run something that had better be fast now that Carrie's done his work. And I thought, you know, it's one of those, I didn't know there's going to be a quiz, you know, I'm in a health class. I didn't know there was a math quiz. And so she sat down and she ran her thing and we're all standing behind her and I'm looking around and everybody's holding their breath and crossed their fingers behind their back. And, and she ran her thing and she turned around and she smiled and gave us one of these and everybody's literally, they clapped like a, like at a golf tournament, like really softly. <laughs> I was like, well, you know, thank God I'm the hero because if I hadn't been, I, I was, I was going to be the goat and thank goodness it's Wednesday. Maybe I'd have time to fix this thing that I didn't even know existed. So it started to like reveal to me over engagements that were similar to this, that, that I'm not looking at the same it that the people who are paying the bill are looking at. And I need to be, I need to be looking at the it. And then there goes on being several stories about how I couldn't have, I couldn't have helped people at all. If I hadn't learned that lesson earlier, there's a, the chapter called 49 grievances where the label printer wasn't working. And if I'd have done the traditional thing, I would have not gone any further than anybody who had already been there. Um, so looking at the right, it is really the, the process of figuring out, okay, what is important, right? The, the business has some goal in mind. You may have a DBA be your interface and he says, we want you to fix the SQL statement, but often there's more to it than that. And sometimes it's more to it than the DBA even knows. And if you go to the business, the business problem might be, yeah, we can't, we can't pay payroll on time. And we think it's because of the SQL statement, but that's different than just come in with your blinkers on and look at the SQL statement. And I found out that there's a lot more value that I can provide if I'm willing to kind of level up and understand more about what the business is trying to accomplish and then help them decide, okay, is there really a cause effect link between what you really want what you really need and what task you think is going to achieve that. And I found that in many places, the, the, the break in the chain is there. They assume this is the, 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 you know, the remedy of a problem, but the problem and the remedy may not be related in the way that people think because they measure wrong and they don't understand some things that I had the luxury of understanding because of whom I worked for and how much experience I was able to amass, you know, in such a short time because I traveled there every single week to a different place. We're, uh, we're here discussing uh, with Kerry Millsap, his new book, Faster. Uh, would love to give away a copy of the book, Kerry, if you're willing. Absolutely. And uh, Michelle, how, how should we how should we give the, the book? Away? So, in in classic insider fashion, we've put together a two truths and a lie. <laughs> and so, we've got two truths and a lie about our guest Carrie. And so, if you want to take a look at those and pop them in the comments, if you figured out which the lie is, and then we'll pick a winner from from those that pick the right pick the lie. So, Carrie was on speed <clears throat> dial for the CEO of Oracle. Carrie's. World. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie's family was once featured on the cover of a magazine. Carrie's always been a big baseball fan and was drafted out of high school by the Atlanta Braves, but chose to go to college instead. So pick out the lie. Put it in the comments. <laughs> hey, um, so back to the to the looking at the right it, a few of your stories in that space involved the the, the conclusion was that you would really needed to actually physically walk up to some of the users that were having issues to visually see with your own right. eyes. So what, I think the, the printer story you needed to, you would never have been able to, to uh, figure out the problem if you hadn't realized that the FTP server needed to be rebooted. Anyway, mm -hmm. something needed a reboot. Right. Um, somebody else was doing a select mm -hmm. or a search and had to Anyway, so it involved yeah. actually walking over and visually seeing what the user was experiencing. Right. Right. It, it reminded me, and Anton's giving me a little bit of a warning because he doesn't know what I'm going to say, but at one case scope, Anton, I can't remember the topic, the subject of your type, the title of your, of your presentation, but it was something like protect your application from your users. 
and you were trying to troubleshoot a performance issue, the database kept going down, you were killing sessions, the minute would be back up again, it would just grind to a halt. And you're like, what, what is this person doing? How, how is the system just getting killed nonstop? And you had to, I think you like had to walk over to a user only to find that they'd left their desk and something had fallen over the keyboard and was just triggering the like submit button nonstop. And was just, and, and that was something that you wouldn't have known how to fix or you actually needed to be looking at the right, it, no amount of performance tuning was gonna solve that problem. So I think that was that. That's, was that's straight, out of, yeah. straight out of Silicon Valley, isn't it? <laughs> the TV show. You know, you, uh, you're supposed to write your test first, but I don't think there's a test you could write <laughs> to, to simulate that action. Spiral notebook on spacebar, yeah, it's like, uh, something. <laughs> it was a long time ago. It might've been the same case scope, the, the 2012 one, so. We used to have at Oracle the, the goal of the installation process because I worked with ST for the server technologies division for a little bit to try to simplify the installations. And we came up with the name of the goal. The goal was a so-called drinking bird install. You remember those things that, that yeah. have the fluid in them and then they go down and take a drink and then they absorb some water and then they go like this and they kind of bounce around and then they fall over. That's what we wanted was just something that you could hit enter about four times and be done with it. And we called it the drinking bird install. I like it. I like it. You know, when, when, <clears throat> when I heard you speak in Dallas the last time, uh, you talked about the, um, the uh, what was it? Uh, you, it? It had to do with receipts. Uh, it was the... Um, Ah. The grocery store receipt and the restaurant receipt. Can we go into that just a, just a little bit? I found I, I really sure. I uh, um, okay. So <laughs> I don't know if I want to use names or not, but in 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 the the presentation that uh, that that you saw, I was showing the receipt from coach he's now the coach of the university of texas football program uh sarkeesian and sark got in trouble either in washington or usc for going to a, a bar with four or five players and spending too much money and if you google it you can find sark's receipt online and basically the the regent's problem was this guy had taken four or five players to a place for breakfast at like 9 45 in the morning and spent like twenty three hundred dollars or some some outrageous amount of money, oh, oh, and so you think, all right, is that reasonable? And you know, I asked the class, well, what kind of what what kind of artifact would you like to see to be able to determine whether that's reasonable? Because maybe it is, maybe it's not. We don't know. And you know, I try to fish out of the audience for them to say the receipt, the receipt. I say exactly. So when you see a receipt, what you see is a list of of items. So there'll be an item name, there'll be a price, and there'll be a quantity. And Sark's receipt happened to say things like uh, Grey Goose vodka shots, $5.50 a piece, 27 of them. And right, it's him and five players. So you're like, okay, there's 30 shots of Grey Goose, there's 60 Heinekens, there's like 30 shots of whiskey, 30 shots of tequila. I'm starting to see the problem here, right? And as you, <laughs> as you take down that problem, what you're doing is saying, okay, if, if you'd had nothing but food, how much would your bill have been? And it's real easy. You go, I'm going to turn the quantity on the Grey Goose to zero, the quantity on the Heineken's to zero. Okay, make it five. That's fine if you want a beer with lunch. Let's turn the quantity on the tequila to zero. Let's turn in. And now let's see what the total is. And if you're thinking spreadsheet, it's super easy to figure this out. You just go, you know, if you hadn't had the alcohol, your bill would have been $219.23. But since you had alcohol, it's 2300 bucks. That's how you solve a problem in, in real life about why did something cost too much? And I think humans are wired to want that information. That's why they give us receipts, right? So we can do that, that kind of diagnostic process. Well, performance can be the same way. When somebody says, hey, why does it take four hours to run payroll? Right? What do we do right. when, when, when we say, okay, hey, why did Sark's receipt? Why was it $2,300? Well, I don't know. Let's mail the National Restaurant Association and find out how much stuff has been prepared in the last four hours um, throughout North America. Well, that's insanity. We don't do that. We want to see the receipt just for Sark. We don't want to see the receipt of any, any of the other people in the in the room with them. That's what we want to see. And it's the same with that 
or that payroll process. I don't want to know, well, the system uh, bought 6 million heads of lettuce during that half hour. No, I want to know how did my process that I care about, my it, how did it spend its time? And you find out, well, it did 256,000 network IOs. And you're like, well, not a lot I can do about that because it's somebody else's code. I can't like change the number of network IOs it did. But I do notice that the network IOs individually cost a little more than I expect that they should for this kind of a configuration where the, the payroll program and the database are on the same machine. So maybe that cost is interesting. And then, so what affects that cost? Well, there's a parameter that affects that cost. Well, let's experiment with changing that and see how the cost changes. And in, in that particular case that I'm, that I'm telling the story about, the payroll story, there happened to have been a misconfiguration. There was a tnsnames.ora file entry that if you change that, it makes the cost of the network IOs go down by a factor of 50. And then you go, well, how much time would I expect that would save me? Well, how much time would it, how much money would it save me if I turned 30 Heineken's into zero? It's exactly the same analysis. And if you have that spreadsheet view of performance about, okay, my thing took four hours. Here is the receipt for that four hours. Um, if you have the ability to do that, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say something really strong and say, you can't be tricked. Either you see the performance problem or there's not a performance problem. If you can look at a receipt and not see anything wrong, then you're done. But if you see a receipt and go, you know what? I shouldn't be doing that at all. Why in the world is it doing that at all? Well, now we're on a quest to figure out how to get a quantity to zero. Why does that cost so much? Well, now we're on a quest to figure out why does that cost so much? I thought we bought a machine that could do better than that. Do you instinctively go to the number of iterations or do you instinctively go to the cost or is it different every single time you look at it? Well, there, there's, you know, a, a, a very tightly defined algorithm in the book called Method R. And it starts with identify the things that are important and prioritize them because we don't want to be looking at priority four things. We want to be looking at priority one things. If in the 49 grievances story, there was a company that was going to go out of business by Friday and if we didn't fix their problems, they were going to do their best to take Oracle Corporation with them in, in their bankruptcy. So, man, we need to figure out what your top priority thing is. And the thing that that company had done really well is they had the list. The list of the right it was on a whiteboard where everybody could see it. And then there was a more detailed version of that in the spreadsheet that people could go to a, a particular war room and visit. And we wanted to make sure we're always pulling that top item off that list. And now that you're now that you know you're looking at the right thing, right? And Michelle mentioned it before. Can't print shipping labels. Well, can't sh print shipping labels. We can't get stuff out of our warehouse onto trucks. We can't charge for it. We can't do business that way. So that was the number one thing when I walked in the door. And um, so when we're when we're looking at the prof at, at a profile, that's what I call that receipt for response time, and that's the name it's had since the 1970s. I'm I'm not trying to claim that I invented the term, but when I look at that profile, you, you basically, each iteration of improving it, right? If we think about the Sark receipts, like, let's get rid of the shots. Okay, now what is it? Nah, it's still too big. Well, let's get rid of half the beer. How about now? Yeah, now it's okay. We're done. The business gets to make that decision. And as a technician, what I owe in response to being able to, to see one of these receipts for a response time is when I say, here's how much it'll cost to go the next step. It might be, we just need to patch tonight. And I know you've got like this labyrinth of patches and you probably can't do that tonight. You probably can't do it for the four months because of all the intricate interdependencies of this patch causes that bug and we can't stand. So, I mean, the cost of something is what a technician is responsible for, for estimating, right? Um, but what we typically find is that in a, in a really poorly performing application, there's usually something pretty easy we can do that'll knock out 20, 30% of the, of the time. And if we can do that, we get the political capital of, okay, I believe this guy, he's, he's, he's onto something here. He's, you know, he's probably going to be able to help us further. And then when, then you basically just regenerate the receipt. How long does it take now? Okay. Well now there's something different at the top of the, of the receipt. Cause we got rid of the top thing that was in there before. And the job of the, of the technical person who's kind of running this analysis is to give the client enough information that the client can stop when the remedy starts to cost more than ha just putting up with the problem. The, the, um, 
how often do you find people straying from like in these performance tuning opportunities from the actual business priority? Right? <laughs> Unfortunately, all the time. And it's rude to laugh, but it's it's so prevalent. I you know, the, there's something here that I thought you might ask that. And I'm if I can find it real quick, I want to read you a quote. Um, and if I can't find it real quick, then I will. Um, just tell you the quote. Yeah, I think it's going to take me longer. But there, there's a, uh, um, a performance analyst from 20 years ago who said something to the effect of people tend to be drawn into the things that are easy to measure and the things that your tools are able to measure are not necessarily the right things to be looking at. Mm. And, and that's the problem is that, um, okay, I get it. Receipt for response time. That's cool. Where in AWR does that appear? And the answer is, well, the Oracle Automatic Workload Repository, I think that's what it stands for, doesn't doesn't give you that receipt. It gives you something that looks like it's formatted like that receipt, but it's really more of a manifest of like how many heads of lettuce came in during this half hour and how many steaks went out during this half hour. But it doesn't necessarily relate to the one weird guy that had tacos at a steak place, right? And his experience was different from anybody else's. And if you start looking at the whole restaurant experiences an average, you're not going to know anything about the guy who had tacos. So I think, Rich, what pulls people off track is, well, this is hard to measure, but that's easy to measure. So let me go live over in easy to measure land. And unfortunately, that that leads people down the wrong trail sometimes. It's, it's even worse than that. Unfortunately, it leads people down the right trail sometimes. And that causes them to trust the process more than it deserves to be trusted. Mm -hmm. And so they come back and think, well, it worked that time. It's going to work this time. And there's a, there's a, a couple of sections or a couple of chapters in the book about skew that explain why, you know, something might work in this situation that might not work in that situation. Hey, I'm going to revisit our giveaway, our two troops in a lie, because I can tell you we do not have a winner yet. Let's put that back up. I'm looking at uh, Eugen. <laughs> Eugen did a did a pretty good shot at it. Uh, okay, maybe I'll need to revisit that. And I see we've got loads of people on the call. So <laughs> put, in, put in your votes for the lie. Which of these three is the lie? Oh, try it. The um, you have a chapter in the book. Um, Beware the system bottleneck. Yes. See my baseball bats back there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Go ahead. Beware yeah. the system bottleneck. Yes. Yeah. Sir. What's the difference between a system bottleneck and just the bottleneck? Is it is it really important to distinguish between the two? So my use of the word the in your question is is pretentious. I'm using it to indicate there's a right definition and there's a not so right definition. Now, depending on which book you pick up, if you go to the index and look up B for bottleneck and find out that it's defined on page 17, it'll say something like um, the component on your system that spends the most time. And then that puts people in the mind of, okay, I'll go run some query against V dollar everything and find out, what thing that Oracle measures, you know, DB files, scattered read, SQL to message from client, all the 2,000 or probably I think 5,000 things that Oracle measures now. And they're all basically just system calls that have different names that Oracle developers have given them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So you can do that and go, okay, on this system, the bottleneck is latch free. And now let me tell the story, which is in the book, of, of course, about payroll. I mentioned payroll a couple of times and I'm referring to the same story and all the times I've mentioned it. Um, we had a company that, uh, that was local in Dallas. We, we called upon them with our sales team to try to sell them some software, sell them some services. They're like, nah, we're cool. We'll call you though. If we have a problem. Well, they had a problem um, where they had just upgraded a Sun Solera server in their place to have faster CPUs. And um, the reason they did this is because for months they've been struggling with meeting their payroll obligations on time. They're supposed to pay paychecks out on Fridays, 
But because payroll was running so slowly, they weren't able to give people checks until maybe the following Tuesday or Wednesday. Now, these are people who are like greenskeepers and lawn mowers and tree trimmers, and they weren't happy not getting paid for the weekend. So they were actually coming in on the weekend and trashing the place, busting windows and doing donuts on golf courses. And they were they were miffed. So that was their business problem. So the technical team knows, OK, payroll's a business problem. So while payroll's running, they looked at the system and saw that the most most consumptive things on that system were one CPU and two latch free. So the mistake they made was right here in the story. They jumped to the conclusion that payroll is being badly affected by CPU and latch free. So they upgraded the system. They had their developers look at payroll and they're like, I don't see anything that would cause payroll to use a bunch of latches, but whatever your data says, I guess go with that. So the definition of the bottleneck they were using was what is the system using the most of while payroll runs? Then we mm -hmm. came in and said, they, they invited us in because they're just like, I don't know what happened, but we upgraded our CPUs and now payroll's even slower than it was before. And we don't get it. And by the way, this is the day after a bunch of airplanes flew into buildings in New York. It's September mm. 12, 2001. So we're all just like, what is, nothing makes sense. Yeah. People are getting killed and I upgrade my CPUs and it slows things down. What in the world is going on? So we got the receipt for what does payroll do when it runs? And it was funny when we asked the questions like, when's the next time you're going to run payroll? The guy tossed his head back and laughed ha 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 like that and and said we are always running payroll and we're like right now you're running payroll right and he's like yep we're running payroll right now and because it's taking so long yeah yeah, yeah. because they yeah. just could catch up they're getting farther behind every week mm. and so we said can we trace it and they're like how do you do that like we got you got a sid and a serial number for me and they're like yep we know exactly which process is doing payroll so we turned on trace and this is back in probably oracle eight maybe early nine i days and we got a receipt for response time. Here's where that, you know, we traced it for half an hour. And then our trace data told us, here's where that half hour went. And the top line on that receipt was SQL net message from client. And the DBA is like, oh, no. And we said, what? And he goes, that's an idle event. And we go, yeah, and? And he goes, we can't do anything about that. Oracle throws that away. That's Oracle being not busy. And we're like, I, I know. But it's also part of your response time. So it's not like we can call up your guys that are doing donuts on the golf course screens and say, hey, it's cool. You know, it's just SQL net message from client. No, it's why you're not getting paid on Friday. So anyway, we figured out, yeah, there's a network configuration problem that's causing these round trips that are taking place to take longer than they should. And why did things slow down when you upgraded CPUs? Well, because there's lots of other things running at the same time as payroll is running. And they used a lot of CPU. And when we fed them more CPU capacity, the things that used to run this long, maybe they did a thousand network IOs in this much time. Now they run in that long. And they still execute a thousand network IOs. So guess what? You just increased the amount of traffic on your network because you upgraded your CPUs. And our payroll thing was suffering from that to begin with. It doesn't use a lot of CPU to begin with. So Michelle, how would you like to have a faster road between Tampa, Florida, and Miami? That'll help you commute to work faster, right? Because it's a faster road. But your answer will probably be no, because I don't go from wherever you said to wherever you said. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't use that. Mm -hmm. well, payroll wouldn't use the extra CPU because it didn't need much to begin with. So the whole thing just fit together like, perfectly. We could explain everything and we could tell them the parameter to change to make that part of payroll, which was half the response time, 50 times faster. So the half hour became about 15 minutes and that enabled them to catch up and get everybody paid. So back to Rich, I did not forget your question. Mm -hmm. In this story, the bottleneck was SQL net message from client round trip traffic during the, the payroll process. And the bottleneck needs to be defined in the context of the it that we care about. The system is not what we care about. That's not the it. But the books define bottleneck and the reports that come out of Oracle by default tend to define bottleneck as the system's biggest time consumer. Mm. But I want to be able to scope that down. I don't care about the system. I don't, 
I don't need a National Restaurant Association of America data. I just need Sark's receipt. Maybe this is too strong a statement, but I've never seen a performance or rarely seen a performance issue solved by throwing more CPU at it or upgrading hardware. It's, it's, it, and I think you, you say as much in the book. It's, you know, that's, the, you, the thing you do is, that. Yeah. I, I agree. And the thing is though, I, I, I don't like, can I, do I have time to tell you another story if I, if I keep it quick? Absolutely. Um, this, this, is, uh, this is your time to shine. <laughs> I was on a panel one time at a, I think it was a MySQL conference, and I'd been invited to sit on this panel. And up with me was a guy from Google, a guy from Microsoft, I think, a guy from Oracle, me, maybe one other person. There were like five of us. And somebody in the audience with, with one of these, with a notepad, says, um, in you folks is just, you know, you've got all these experiences and you're distinguished, you know, to be on the panel and everything. But what is the most common performance problem that you see in the field? And the first guy, I don't know, the Google guy, he's like, it is always CPU. If it's IO, it's, you know, it, you've done something wrong that's silly and most people don't do silly things. So it's always, in my experience, always CPU. Another guy goes, I mean, in my experience, it's pretty much almost always IO. And then he explained his his perspective and he got to me third. And I said, can I be the last guy to go? Do you mind if I like, if you do the other two and then I'd like to say something at the end? And I'm like, no, that's fine. A little weird, but okay, we'll let you, do, we'll let you go last. So the other two guys are like, oh, in my experience, it's always latching. And oh, I agree with that guy. It's always CPU. And then it came back to me. And the question was, what is the most common performance problem you see in the field? And my answer, and I still stand by it today, my answer was, the most common performance problem I see in the field is people thinking that their problem must be like what the most common problems other people have are. <laughs> this, this like innate, you know, need for people to go, I'm probably average. And so whatever you guys are suffering from, that's probably what I'm suffering from. <laughs> if it were super hard, if it were really, really, really expensive, to do like a more pinpoint diagnosis, then I can see why people would resort to that. But it's just not. I mean, I can show you a receipt for response time and go, you know what? This is really weird. But in your case, I think a CPU upgrade would help because there, there do exist situations in which that is true. And other, you know, sure, I'm going to look at one of these and go, yeah, I've seen that before a thousand times. And then the, the client's like, oh, why didn't I check that? And the answer is, no, 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 you don't need to check everything. I've also seen 5,000 other things that you don't have. So you don't have to check everything. All you have to do is ask your system, how is the time for this important thing being consumed? And that's your thing. Everybody else may have COVID. You may have a broken finger. A COVID shot is not going to help your broken finger, right? And your thing's really rare. And okay, I get that. But your thing needs treatment for your thing, not for the average thing. Maybe you also have COVID, but your finger is the worst problem for some reason. You know, it's it it starts with priority. And then it's, you know, I don't care how common your problem is. We can see exactly what your problem is if we measure it correctly. Yeah, you, know, you talk about adding CPU uh, and not solving the problem. You know, in Houston, we have a lot of traffic. You got your share of traffic up there in Dallas as well. And there was a study done. If they added like four more lanes on 10. And they said the amount of benefit would be so short lived because there's only a certain amount of people that take that road. And if you had the more lanes, it would just encourage more people. So yeah. your, your, your throughput is <laughs> going to be equal to what it, to what it is now, even though you've added four more lanes. Yeah. Yeah. The queuing stuff is, is interesting because it's so counterintuitive at some, at some points. And, you know, practical minded people use the term common sense a lot. And I don't think I talk about it much in the book, but anytime, anytime I hear the word common sense, I, it's kind of a red flag because in, in what I do, sometimes a lot of stuff is counterintuitive. Um, hey, can we, uh, can we do something here? I, do we have a, do we have a correct answer yet, Michelle? If, if not, then what we're going to do is uh, we'll take one of the two truths and we'll have you identify it. And that way we're reducing the, uh, Producing it I down to just the truth seen, and a lie. You can create the Monty Hall problem. 
the right answer. Mark, have you seen the right answer? I can see you. Can you nod your no right answer yet, right? No. All right. So I didn't think we were going to stump people. This is <laughs> You're stumped, I know. So as a reminder. So Carrie, All right, so you... which one of these, uh, out, out of the two truths, uh, let's eliminate one of them, Carrie. Well, um, number one is, is uh, materially true. <laughs> Okay. Number okay. one is materially true. So it's down to numbers two and three. One of those is true. One is a lie. Uh, we're going to, we're going to see if uh, we can get a correct answer and, uh, and have this, uh, and then we'll deliver three is a lie. Okay. Oh, but Anton wants to know if it'll be autographed. <laughs> Dig digitally autographed. Digital. <laughs> I'll have to do an NFT. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, we have a winner. We have a winner. True. We're not drafted by the Atlanta Braves. I, I, I'm, I, I'm saying this is correct. My, so, my high school didn't even have a baseball program. Is that a truth? <laughs> yeah, I played. I played baseball till about the fifth grade when it went away. And so how then, hard of a choice would that have been for you? If if you'd have been drafted out of high school and then given a minor league contract, would you be, oh. would you have uh, foregone uh, your your college career and gone straight to the pros? It's <laughs> it's it's hard to know. I, I can answer that a couple of ways. One is there's so many years between when I had to stop and when your hypothetical situation would begin that it's hard for me to fill in that gap. Because mm. if I really were playing baseball the whole time, I assume I would love it, and then it would come down to okay, what's the money amount? But back in those days you know, your tree trimmer and your baseball player made about the same amount of money. True. Now, another way I could answer it is I've got a 24 year old boy who's a baseball player in college oh. and he's, he's expected his whole life to be drafted. He was, he was named as a nine year old along with Bobby Witt jr. The top, top nine year old in North Texas, Arkansas, wow. Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma. And then Bobby Witt is the number one draft choice a few years later in the in the majors, and Nick's not drafted yet. So, I promise you, if he had gotten like a like a six million dollar deal like like Bobby got, he'd be going to college later. He wouldn't have skipped yeah. college; he'd have deferred it. Yeah. Um, you had so, uh, you had some baseball videos on that that uh, fateful night where I explained my man crush. You had some baseball videos that you showed as part of that uh, presentation too, because I think you are, you were missing a game or something that. Yeah. I had some, yeah. had some oh. photos. My, uh, yeah. my wife is a, an extraordinarily good photographer and she had some, some, um, I think they, it was just like a fast shot sequence, maybe yeah. video too, but of my, my son coming in and, and uh, tagging home plate, you know, on a, on a slide off line. It was pretty exciting. It was. And uh, I didn't miss many games. I didn't miss many games, but, um, and that's why, I left Oracle to do the entrepreneur thing. I, I thought I could probably earn a living, which knock on wood so far I've, I've kind of held it together. Um, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to miss, I didn't want to miss my kids growing up and wow. athletics has been a really important part of all three of my children's lives and our life too. My, my daughter, um, is verbally committed to uh, West Texas A&M and Canyon. They just won in volleyball and they just won the national championship last week. So she is so Wonderful. stoked. Um, wonderful, and wonderful, I mean, wonderful. our whole family has been a very sports oriented family and a lot of things that, that we talk about are metaphor, you know, we'll have a sports metaphor for it. Here, I, I have to now throw up the picture, put up the picture. Uh, 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 <laughs> look how pretty we are. <laughs> you are very pretty. All of we you. Are. I love the doggies. <laughs> yeah. We've got uh, a little mini schnauzer and a, yeah. uh, um, a Havanese in my daughter's lap there. Oh, great. So photo. the, the six, three guy back in the back is my baseball player. And the, uh, gentleman on my right ear is, uh, going to be getting his bar exam in about July. He's finishing his uh, law, law school career this year. Excellent. Congratulations. They both look the part. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, Michelle, Rich, uh, we could talk to Carrie, uh, Oh, we oh, well, day. actually, Anton really did want a an answer to his question earlier. How many times have you recommended a hardware upgrade to solve a problem ever? 
I want to say yes to the ever, but I'm really struggling trying to come up with an example. There's, there's a story in the book called Kevin where they had done a hardware upgrade before we ever got there. And it was a really good idea. They, they benefited tremendously from it, but there's also, um, I don't think we mentioned my blog. It, there's kerrymillsap.blogspot.com. There's some other stories that aren't in the book. Um, and one of them was in response to um, an article that I read, somebody else's blog, about um, moving to SSD. And this is back 15 yeah. years ago when it was kind of a you know a unique thing to be thinking about doing, like a really elite thing to be thinking about doing. And this was a really famous, it was Joel Spolsky, I think. Um, a really famous blogger, millions of people reading his blog. And he was openly wondering how it would improve the system if he got SSD. I'm like, well, there's that word again, that S word. Um, because when I say system, a DBA thinks one thing, a user thinks a totally different thing, right? To a DBA, a system is, is memory and CPU and disk and SQL statements and latch free and, and, to a user, it's that one form they let me use and the, those three reports I run every day. And the bottleneck for the user, you know, to help the user may not be anything near what the bottleneck to help the DBA statistics would be. And so the the whole thing is, yeah, if, if I can tell you that we've eliminated all of the, for example, IO calls that we can, but still the ones that are left cost too much, then yeah, we probably need to add another SAN or maybe we need to add more, more this to the SAN or maybe, in fact, I can. I can remember a time when I recommended more hardware. Um, the, um, um, the, the hosting facility that's got like 600 customers all running on eight boxes that are all connected to one big EMC SAN in the middle and mm -hmm. you end up with a run queue depth on the SAN, like, a, like an IO queue depth of like 40 plus. Yeah, that's when you start saying, all right, everybody can't live on the same box here. We need to start, you need to buy a little bit of extra stuff and we need to like split people onto two different sands instead of one. So it has happened, um, but I just, it's partly genetic, but it's partly because it's the right answer. It's almost always cheaper to eliminate waste than it is to feed waste with more capacity. But sometimes it's easier to feed the waste with more capacity. And people are like, I don't want to have to be smart. I just want to spend some money and make the problem go away. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Being smart is definitely an advantage. You know, for us, the sun rises and sets uh, with, with Apex uh, at Insum. What are your own personal thoughts about the tool? Do you, uh, how much experience do you have with it, if any? I mean, I think you would be a fan of it just because you're such yeah. a database guy. Well, I don't have a lot of experience with it. And, and you know, I've known Rich for quite a while and really hadn't stayed connected to him really closely until about a year and a half ago or so. Right. And I don't have Apex installed on my laptop. Um, I've got, you know, I'm friends with several people in the Dallas area that are, that are Apex folks and stuff. And, and um, I, I, it, it seems like it's a really popular platform for a lot of people to get a lot of window on data work done really quickly. Um, the thing that's been exciting to me is that rich kind of, um, came up with the idea that that my company should be a partner of Insum, and that through that partnership I could learn a lot more and maybe reach more audience with the, you know with our stuff. Basically, what I do for a living is I make software tools that um, make having that receipt easy for right. response time. And and Rich came at me with the idea of hey, you should integrate that into the Apex world. And we've been spending some time together trying to figure out all right, where do these trace how do you trace Apex? Where does the trace file go? What's the scope of the trace file? Is, this, is the trace file this big and we wish it were that big? Or is it this big and we wish it were that big? Or is it perfect to begin with? How do we fetch the file? Do we, you know, is there like a create directory object that people normally use? Or do they go to the file system or their tools? And mm. it sounds kind of like it's been two universes with not much overlap. And I'm, I'm trying to stretch the two bubbles into overlapping to where we can make it so easy for Apex developers and users to trace Apex applications that they actually will. And of course, at that point, welcome to my world. We can tell you lots of things you can do with that data once you go grab it. Yeah. Uh, I remember Mark, years ago. The, uh, the two into yeah, thank you, Mark, for putting the QR code up there again. Uh, 
please, you'd be doing yourself a huge uh, uh, service uh, if you went out and purchased uh, Carrie's book. Uh, you will you will benefit from it, uh, no doubt about it. And uh, and if you're not if it's not what you do for a living, you'll still enjoy all the stories. Uh, I mm -hmm. love yeah. I love the way the book flows. Uh, Carrie, you've done a great job with it. Uh, Michelle, Rich, do any other questions uh, for Carrie before we uh, before we close? No, just thanks for your time, Carrie. Really appreciate. Oh, it. it's been a really a real pleasure. I wish we could do it every week. <laughs> so we've, we've and Mark's just <laughs> falling over in the background. <laughs> no, it's been so, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for for joining us. My oh, Karen, Cer hey, certainly nice has. See you, Karen. Hey, Karen. No, it's been a great it's been a great hour. Uh, you know, uh, write another book because we'd like to do this again, uh, Karen. Well, do you know what? <laughs> Look at Rich. He knows. Yeah. <laughs> there'll, there'll be another book coming out in about, I'm hopeful in about a month. And it's called Tracing Oracle. It'll be a book lit. It'll be really little. But it's essentially, if if you if you go get this called Mastering Oracle Trace Data, there's so much stuff in here that it's kind of hard to find. Just the simple pathway for somebody who's never traced before. And this right. book will be for people who've never traced before to make it super easy to understand what do I mean when I say scope your data correctly and that kind of stuff. So it'll be a fast read. It's probably, you know, less than an hour for the whole book. And we'll have that out as soon as I can get it finished. So you'll come back and uh, discuss that book when it's out. Love to. All Love right. To. Well, let's make it happen. Michelle, you want to want to go ahead and uh, bring us to a close here? <clears throat> the music and we'll dance on out of here <laughs> <laughs> hey thank you all so Dick. much thank you so much carrie it's been great thanks. and rich thanks rich mm -hmm.